Welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Uh, eating healthy and exercising often is so important that our next presenter, Dr. Dean Creelers, is certainly an expert in this area and is going to give you some tips to use. He is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy in the School of Medical Rehabilitation and an adjunct professor in the Department of Physiology in the Faculty of Medicine. He has made significant contributions to building community wellness in the province of Manitoba through his volunteer work and has earned national and international awards for his scientific research and innovation. His research focuses on physical activity, obesity and disease prevention. All of uh, you students have grown up in a world where technology plays an, in, an increasing role. How does that affect your lifestyle? How does it work against you? And how does it work uh, in, uh, to your advantage? Today, Dr. Creelers is going to get us thinking about impact of technology on lifestyle and how we can use technology to our favor. I hope this means playing more Wii Fit. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. J uh, Dean Creelers. Thank you. Well, I just uh, updated my Facebook as we were presenting, as all of you did. Hopefully all of your uh, Facebook up updates are happening as lively as mine right now. Um, the greatest number of users in uh, the world related to these devices right now is not your age group, it's actually mine. Um, so we are uh, the largest percentage of users in the BlackBerry iPhone market, not your age group, which is actually an interesting uh, uh, fallacy that people think that it's your generation that's uh, really driving this technology. Interestingly, uh, my daughter, who's turning 17 right away, had a party at my house the other day, and there was 25 uh, of her friends there, and three of them were sitting on the couch together, talking to each other, but not verbally, but just by using this device, <laughs> and then talking upstairs to the people about the people in the next room, etc. I thought it was quite hilarious. And then I realized that just the other day, we were, my son and my daughter were sitting on my couch and my son was beside me with his laptop, I was sitting with my laptop and my daughter beside me and my laptop. We were all watching TV, doing our work at the same time and I thought, what an interesting vision of uh, the future and the reality of, of our world today. Um, what I've done today for you is uh, try to put together a presentation that will challenge your thinking about uh, the generation uh, that we've created for you and uh, how you have to work with that uh, impact of technology and choosing what's good and bad for you. I do a lot of work and my job in my life has been devoted to understanding what good and bad is and trying to alter people onto the good path. Um, I grew up in an era of uh, evangelism and I learned from the very best on how to work with people, teach them, indoctrinate them to change towards the good path and that's why I'm here today. Uh, this is the generation that you live in and I live in. It's quite an interesting generation. If you recognize all of those uh, monikers and icons of our age, as you certainly all do, it's changed dramatically since uh, the first computer in the 70s. And uh, all of these features are great advantages to us as well as pose some limitations as well. Uh, so today I'm going to try to give you some tips to success if you're all coming to this wonderful institution of the University of Manitoba, which I dearly love. I think there are some great programs here and I think there's something for you here into this future. And independent of whether you do your studying here, whether you choose to go to university or not, the road to success is a complicated one in this day and age and even the meaning of success is complicated. One downer that I'm going to share with you is this slide right here. If you take a look at this slide, what it is is done on about 6,000 people. There was a study completed uh, last year by a person named Troiano. And if you focus on the blue section which says all, it shows you the percentage of people, males and females, that adhere to the physical activity guidelines that we set up for youth and adults. It says from 6 to 11 years old, that on average only 48% of males and 34% of females actually meet the physical activity guidelines for youth. 
which is 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity five or more days of the week. You'll notice by 12 to 15, it drops precipitously from 48% in males to 11 and from 34 to only 3% in females. By the time you get up to 20 to 59 years old, only 3% of North Americans, that would be Americans and Canadians, not including Mexican population, 3% are meeting the physical activity guidelines today. If you don't meet the physical activity guidelines, what does that mean? It means that you'll not have good bones. It means that you won't have good heart. It means that you won't have good muscles. It means that you won't have necessarily a good brain. It is well demonstrated in literature that all of those four things come from regular physical activity. And this is the downer. Now, what has caused this? Nobody really knows. It's dramatically changed. We live in a very interesting society right now and this Facebook generation is the generation that must change and modify this result in order to uh, create a better future for us and I'll explain that as we go on. Uh, the top pedometer researcher in the world is in Tucson, Arizona. She's a former Canadian from Prince Edward Island. Her name is uh, Ka Catherine uh, Tudor Locke and she actually was here uh, a year ago, came to my lab and she actually used this gag that I'm about to do on you right now in one of her presentations and it is so true. She asked the audience, which you won't do right now, how many of your parents' parents walked to school and everybody put up their hands. How many of your parents walked to school? Everybody put up their hands. How many of you walked to school? And it was almost nobody who put up their hands. In one single generation, one generation, we've eradicated a human behavior in Canada and the United States. And that behavior is walking to school. And in Manitoba, we've measured that through numerous research studies where we put on very fancy technology on you guys and we put on devices called pedometers, which are not that fancy, but also these devices called accelerometers and they measure every five seconds, every movement that you make throughout the entire day for up to 21 days straight. And then I can download that information and see the pattern of activity that you guys do, including adults. And what it means on average is that people who don't walk to school lose about 2,000 steps a day. 2,000 steps a day, the recommendation for your age group is around 15,000 steps per day. For an adult, it's 10,000. So if you lose 2,000 steps a day, that's a significant proportion of those steps. Now, should we all start walking to school again? I don't think so. I think the Facebook generation isn't about walking to school. It's about getting there just in time. That's what we do. <laughs> and we have a just-in-time society, let me tell you that. We love our Wii Fits, don't we? Should you go out and buy them? Are they physical activity tools? Absolutely not. Are they fun? For sure. Um, the government, actually, the minister actually just texted me this morning, literally this morning, saying, Dean, I need a position statement from you recommending whether we give funding to schools to support the use of Wii's in schools. I have to give the minister responsible for that funding a decision by Monday to say, is it a good idea to fund those? Well, they're fun, but are they going to fix the physical inactivity problem? I don't think so. They're not the solution. The solution has nothing to do with that technology, which is wonderful, by the way. I use them. They're great tools. I'm at, up at 1 o'clock at night playing Call of Duty with my son, waiting for Gears of War 3. Here's a sign of heart disease. There's the early signs of heart disease. Does that look like my house? Well, my house is a little cleaner than that because you know what? I don't want to do any physical activity in my house. I hire people to do it for me. Every two weeks, somebody comes in and cleans up my house because I got to get here and do my work just in time society. But this picture right there is not only a symbol of heart disease, it also is a symbol of the development of the disease called osteoporosis, which is where your bones go away. And I'll show you some of our recent studies that we've done on that. It also is directly related to cancer, fatal cancers. It is well demonstrated in over 70 studies that the more physical activity you do, the less your risk of dying from cancer is. Despite this, we're becoming less and less active. 
it's also directly proportional to type 2 diabetes, directly. Meaning, if you're not active, your likelihood of getting type 2 diabetes dramatically increases. In Manitoba, we are recognized as having the youngest people in the world developing type 2 diabetes from inactivity and overconsumption of food. Six years old. This province, thank you very much. Good record to have. Depression, directly tied to physical activity. Osteoarthritis, 87% of people in Manitoba that get their knees replaced, 3,000 knees replaced per year in this province, 87% are obese, not overweight, obese. That obesity results in greater loading between the two bones of your knee, resulting in degeneration of that knee much quicker than if you have normal body weight. The minister asked me all the time, well, Dean, what should I do about this? I said, well, why don't you have a credible obesity clinic in the province of Manitoba instead of you weight loss or another place, herbal magic? Where's the government-run obesity clinic? Anybody know? I don't see it. Useful. Where do you go for that? Who do you see? So you all have laps in this audience, right? See your laps right now? Go touch your lap. Where's your lap? Just touch it. Feel that lap right there in front of you. Yeah, it's a nice lap. Well, interestingly enough, my lap has gone and disappeared because I'm standing up right now. I have no lap. The lap is an interesting thing because if you have a lap and you're sitting in front of your computer, you're inactive. And you know what? The lap is also an interesting thing because my lap, when I'm sitting down, is a great place for my favorite. My favorite is Miss Vicky. I love her. <laughs> Miss Vicky chips? You know Miss Vicky's chips? Oh, they are so yummy and delicious. The lap is not only a place for inactivity, but the lap is also a place for high calorie, convenient foods like Miss Vicky. Miss Vicky sits on my lap and she never says no. I love her to pieces. <laughs> she smells great. I open her up. The snackmosphere just wafts out and I love her and I cannot stop. I had to break up with Miss Vicky. I broke up with her a little while ago, two years ago, actually to the day. Sad to say. Just say no to laps. This is an interesting one. This, whoever that guy is, I don't know if he's meaningful at all, but that guy there, a little bit older than me. He said something very interesting and I want you to think about this one for a second because it, it takes a second to read it and then understand what he's really saying. The function of protecting and developing health must rank even above that of restoring it when it is impaired. We love our health care. Don't ever take away our hospitals. But do we want our health? I say to you, most of us don't want health, but we want good health care. We want when we are in need for help, pull us out from drowning in the river. Please save me. But we don't want our health. Clearly, 97% of us are not active enough to maintain good health. 97%. Oops. Where do we put our, you know how much money our health care system costs? But how much money do we put into prevention? A nickel for every billion? Maybe it's that ratio. Maybe it's $100 to a billion, but it's certainly not much off from that. M&M's candies, markets to you guys, and you know their little faces. The M&M's candies guys, $44 million a year is what they spend on advertising to sell M&M's candies. That's bigger than our national budget for participation. Participation has been running for 30 years, and during that time we've had the greatest rise in obesity in our country ever. Did it cause it? Did it prevent it? Well, they didn't have it in the United States. They have the same rate of obesity as us, maybe 1% higher. Bad and badder. Hmm. So what are the keys to success? Maybe I can share that with you. First thing is, this is a great thing. Affirmation. Every morning, every morning you should wake up and when you look in the mirror and you brush your teeth and maybe you do this, you should say to yourself, am I happy? Nah, that's not a good question. I hear couples say it to the, couples say it to each other all the time. Are you happy? 
Are you happy? Are you happy? That's an interesting thing to ask a person because I'm not always happy and I'm a pretty happy guy. But one thing you should think and ask yourself, if you want to change and make things good for yourself, you should ask yourself, do I deserve happiness? That's a very different question. Ask your partner that. Do you deserve happiness? You might treat me better if you did. <laughs> That's the definition of self-esteem, folks. And the number one thing we see related to not changing in life, and I work with thousands of clients per year and subjects on this topic, is that they don't think they deserve it anymore. You should deserve happiness. I deserve happiness. Get up in the morning, say that. Hey, I deserve happiness. How do I get it? For you guys, for my life, this has been my balance. This is tough. Giving and taking. I volunteer about 20 to 30 hours a week at least up to 60 hours a week of volunteering. Now, that's giving. But I have to make sure and I have to learn to take for myself because I deserve happiness. I have to keep my body and my mind in proper shape. I have to keep myself so I'm not super stressed out because I had a grant due at 4 o'clock today and I had to do this presentation so I had to rush to get it done early this morning and stayed up all late last night till 3 in the morning to get the grant in because I had to be here. This is important to me. It's probably more important than the grant that I wrote this morning to be here with you. Because one of you changes, hey, I'm a pretty happy guy. But it's all about giving and taking, not just giving to yourself and taking from your, it's all about making sure that you take, so making sure that you can give into your future. Balancing in this life is not an easy matter. <laughs> just in time society, right? This is what we do, we're all just in time. How do you balance? How do you balance life? How do you become a balanced person? That's really what this is all about. Believing in yourself is important. It's critical to do so. And believing that you deserve happiness. Despite what I just said, it's important for you to realize this. Canada is a great country. I love this country. And it's a great time to wave flags with the Olympics on right now. And we're doing fine. Even though they told us we'll be on the top of podium, I never believed that. I don't know why they said that. But independent of that, this is a great country. This is U.S. data, the United States, and the United States and us, same two letters. We're basically the same as the United States. Not identical, but very close. The good news is why I want my children to grow up in Canada, being 17 and 19 years old, is this right here. From 1950 till now, there's been a dramatic decrease in the numbers of deaths. What a wonderful thing. Look at that data. Heart disease dropping off. People who die from heart disease dropping off. People who die from cancer in the last four years dropping off dramatically. People who die from stroke dropping off. People killing themselves dropping off. Yeah, oops. CLRD, you're wondering what's that? What's increasing? Lung disease. Not from smoking, but from particulate matter in the environment, pollution. But that's great news. The life expectancy of us right now is around 80 years. What a great life. That's pretty long, isn't it? But interestingly enough, from 1976, when I graduated from high school, and I must have caused this, I think. <laughs> I, I'm going to the psychiatrist for treatment for that, by the way. But from 1976, when I graduated high school, you'll notice something. The rates of overweightedness and obesity have been rising dramatically, and they are not blunted. The most recent data released two months ago clearly shows we're still way on the rise. We've not abated whatsoever. This is happening. Physical inactivity is decreasing. Overconsumption of food is happening. Yet, our lifespan has been increasing. <coughs> Paradox, contradiction. How is that happening? Well, the wonderful thing here is in institutions like this, we make the best drugs on earth. We do. Is that a bad thing? No. I want my good drugs for our society to help people. I work in a rehab hospital, and I'll tell you, we need these drugs. Look at the rate of prescriptions of blood glucose medications and blood lipid medications. Excuse me. You'll notice that there's dramatic increases in prescription medications for problems that we have, which are related to inactivity. We have 80-year lifespan. My son, 19 years old, at this institution 
will be the first of the Facebook generation to have a shorter lifespan than my generation. The next generation will have a shorter lifespan, first time on record. We predict because the rate of type 2 diabetes is rising so quickly due to inactivity that even though we have great drugs, we won't be able to fend it off anymore. So I submit to you very carefully that we are the most knowledgeable society on earth. We are. Google and Wiki are great things. They are. I do my homework using Wiki. If I need to learn something, do I go on Wiki right away? Absolutely. Do I hate Google? No, I don't. Do I think Bill Gates has a bad haircut? Yes. <laughs> we are a very knowledgeable society, but I'm going to argue to you this. Despite our knowledge, I would argue to you we are not enlightened. And enlightened means that we wisely use our knowledge. And our knowledge says we know these things that I've shown you. Disease is related to inactivity. Knowledge clearly demonstrated, hmm, do we do anything about it? Hippocrates was right. So you got to believe in, and what do you believe in? What do you need to do? Well, the biggest loser. That's the solution. <laughs> yeah, what a show on TV. Interesting show, eh? The biggest loser. I have clients. I, I practice as well as I do research on obesity. I have people coming up to me who say, and I work with people who need to lose a half a pound, no joke, because they're bikini models, all the way to people who have to lose three, four hundred pounds. No joke. They're all the same. They share more things in common than they are different in their approaches. Way more in common. I put them in rooms together, no difficulties. The point is though, people look at this and they go, hey, I can change that quickly. I say, yeah. Come on, I'll change you as quickly as that show. This is all you need to do. You're going to take a leave of absence from your work. Okay, no problems for two months. You're going to leave your family so there's no stress from that. You're going to live with me in a nice place. We're going to have people cooking for us, a personal trainer for us, and you're going to pay my salary so I can be with you for that two months as well. And then we can get that result. And they go, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, do you think anybody does? Yeah. No. But this mentality of rapid change, shortcut behavior, unrealistic behavior permeates us. This is cool. Is that real? Absolutely it's real. Can you achieve results like that? Possibly. But is that the upper limit? Yes, it is. What's more realistic? Well, this influences the thing I talked about earlier, self-esteem. And I'm going to use my university voice for a second to read you that definition, a very important one because it's critical. Self-esteem, the disposition to experience oneself as competent to cope with the challenges of life and deserving of happiness. So if you deserve happiness, you've got good self-esteem. If you're competent to cope with the challenges of life, you've got good self-esteem. Self-esteem is critical. And you know what? If you want to improve self-esteem in this day and age, you should have your expectations in line with your successes. We, as your previous generation, make you believe you've got to aim high and reach the world. Absolutely you should have that. Have goals that are enormous. I just mixed two words together. <laughs> enormous. It's going to show up on uh, dictionary.com, I bet. <laughs> However, it's important nowadays when I'm working with people because of shows like The Biggest Loser, when I'm working with people and designing research studies, you know what I have to do? I manipulate, number one, their self-esteem. I don't say get busy with being active. I don't say eat better. I work with their self-esteem, number one. And you know what I do? I change their expectations. I drop them because their expectations are like that and I make their expectations shrink so they can get success. If your expectations are like that, you could have a big dream, but my expectation to change is this. Let's set a goal so we get the right outcome. If you get the right outcome, you feel success. Then you keep on moving along. So it's critical to lower your expectations and set realistic goals in order to get good self-esteem. Here's, here's our parents nowadays. <laughs> Taking the escalator to their fitness place. 
My daughter looks at me when I leave to go exercise. I leave like this in my work t-shirt. And uh, I leave like this, come back an hour and a half later looking like this, and then she says, hey dad, do you want to go play? And I says, I'm too tired, I just worked out. Just because she doesn't look at me and say, oh, Dean, he's a 49-year-old fit male. I want to be like him. That was a Dutch accent, not really, more <laughs> Swedish. But my daughter doesn't look at me nor my son and say, he's fit, therefore I want to be like him. It's more about me being a facilitator of, his, of their fitness. You do not have to be fit to be a role model. You have to be a facilitator of other people's behaviors towards good physical activity and good nutrition. Here's the top three things your parents say to you. You got any homework? What's the next thing they say? Clean up your room. The third thing they say to you after you get through the door is, don't punch out your sister. <laughs> Those are the three top things that parents message their children. The last things we message you is get more physically active. If I have a grade six kid, you know what the best thing to ask them when they come through the door is? What did you do during your favorite topic, favorite class in school today, which is recess? What did you do in recess? And you know what the very first reaction is in the Facebook generation? The child goes like, I didn't push anybody. I'm not a bully. Were you active? No, they took the balls away from us. We're not active in schools anymore. They took the balls away from us, could kick them on the roof. And you go, but what did you do? Oh, nothing. Oh, interesting. Here's the problem, son. There's my son. The problem, son. Intel inside, idiot out. <laughs> there he is. He's got a lap. He's got his toque on in the house. He's on a, he's got two computers with watching TV. He's got Google running just in case I walk into the room and he can say I'm doing homework. <laughs> and then he's on MSN talking to 17 people. He's downloading MP3s and movies at the same time. He's playing a violent video game and he's got his Miss Vicky goldfish there and chocolate covered almonds beside him. That's the generation. You see yourself there? Yeah, you do. <laughs> not a book in sight. Hey, do you need a book anymore? I'm not so sure you do. Do I like reading books? Sure I do. Do I have now a, a, a book reader? Absolutely. Interesting. New world we live in. The problem, son. Hmm. Here's the problem. In 2004, the amount of time that the average child of your age sits in front of a media or a computer screen or something like that is six hours and 21 minutes a day, which is almost all the leisure time of your day. Lap time galore. You'll notice that from 1999 to 2004 that the things that increased were computer time and video games. From 27 minutes to an hour a day, from 26 minutes of video games to 49 minutes a day. Very cool. That sums up to seven hours in uh, 1999 to eight hours and 30 minutes. But you don't do eight hours and 30 minutes because you're like my son, you multitask. You are the best multitasking generation on earth. <laughs> do I want that as graduate students? Yes, please do. Any of the good ones in this audience, competition is king right here, come on into my lab. I need highly competitive multitasking people that are resourceful and independent. Please come to my door. I'll take you anytime and get you scholarships. The key part there is six hours and 21 minutes a day of lap time. Did Bill Gates create that for us? Not really. One thing you need to know, and this is, there's so much malarkey out there because the government doesn't do anything about this issue because it's hard to. There is nothing that violates the law of thermodynamics, which is calories in and calories out. Calories in and calories out. Nothing violates that law. It's not when you eat, it's not what you eat. It is irrelevant. If you overconsume food and don't have a lot of activity, any input over output stays put. <laughs> you got me on that? Any input over output stays put. It doesn't matter whether the input comes from carbohydrates, fat, or protein. It's myth. Eating healthy is not healthy. I'll say that again, be very clear on this. If you eat healthy, you are not healthy. Impossible. Impossible to eat, eat healthy and be healthy. You must eat healthy and be physically active. 
If you do not have both of those, you are not healthy. You can eat all the calcium you like and your bones will go away. At your, actually a few years before your age, 25% of your bone mass is accrued at around peak when your body grows rapidly. 25% of your bones are laid down during the time of puberty and growth spurt. Remember how inactive we are? You think we have an osteoporosis problem now? 20 years from now, uh-oh. This is our lives. Calories in, lots of those. Calories out, not so much. So what's the correct answer? It's not diet. Diet, bad word. See this right here? Eat like a pig, run like a dog. That's the correct answer. We want both those boxes as big as possible. Not tiny. Think it through. Dietary restriction is a shortcut to nothing. Matter of fact, most people who diet to lose weight, they lose the weight and six weeks later they put on more than they lost. Oops. The only way to get this done is by having your physical activity increase and eating the right amount of food to match that. Portion distortion. We live in a society with the greatest portion distortion on earth. See these two pictures right here? The one on your left is what we typically get served in restaurants. The one on the right is the correct portionality of food. Right there. I'm going to do it with you. I'm gonna, I no, don't normally do this, but we're going to do it together. We're going to do, and I encourage you for your dinners at least twice in the next week to do this. You'll shock your parents. Ready? We're going to learn the sign language diet. Ready? Everybody with me. Put your hands together like that. Just like that. Everybody got that? Look down at that. That is how many vegetables you should have on your plate. <laughs> See that? Vegetables? Over half of your plate should be that. Yeah, good laughter. Now hold it. Now the next one. Next one. Give me one of those. That right there is your meat or alternatives. Right there. Okay? And that right, well, I switched it. Sorry, I'm going to do it again. Let's everybody follow me. Vegetables and greens, yeah. Carbohydrates, protein, the palm of your hand. So we'll do it again. Vegetables and greens, carbohydrates, a potato, <laughs> okay? And right there, the size of your palm of your hand, which is the size of a deck of cards, is the protein on your plate. Please, that's called the sign language diet. That sign language diet, try that out instead of a whole plate of spaghetti. There's Miss Vicky. I, I keep her picture close to me. She's so lovely. Bye bye, Miss Vicky. She still calls to me. She calls me all the time, and I, I, I miss her. 1,300 calories per bag. All I have to do in order to burn that off is run a half marathon, 13.2 miles, at a seven minute mile pace. That's it. That's it. No big deal. No big deal. Bye bye, Miss Vicky. Ah, we're, we're a dysfunctional group. Take a look at the nutrition facts right here. That's yogurt. And you know what we do? Which one do we buy? We go to the stores, we buy the fat-free one. Oops! Watch this, guys. Take a look. 100 calories in regular yogurt, but if you buy the fat-free one, which has nothing to do with input-output, stays put, you get, whoops, you get 152 calories. Why? Because in fat-free yogurt, they add sugar to taste good. Sugar is not evil. It runs through my veins. But the point is, 50 more calories a day, no joke. Remember input output guys? If input is over output by 50 calories only every day, it's nine pounds of fat you'll put on a year. 50 calories. So you choose fat free because fat is bad for you? Well trans fat, yeah, get rid of it. It's not, it's input over output, the primary rule. Self-esteem, dream big. Set your goals for yourself. What are your physical activity goals? If you don't have any goals, what are they? Schedule it. In this just-in-time society, I schedule everything. 
My little BlackBerry beeps when I'm about to exercise. I schedule my workouts in. If I did not, everything else expands to remove my workouts in my day. If you don't schedule your workouts or schedule your physical activity, it won't happen because we live in that just in time society. You guys, when you start going to school, cognitive load, lots going on, right? Stress of studying hard. It's easy to go and kick away exercise or physical activity. Well, I'll tell you right now, during that time is even more important to be physically active. If you're not physically active, you can't blow off steam. You don't assimilate information very well, etc. Some people need motivation to exercise. <laughs> Here's the good life. When, 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 it, when I say, what's the good life? And everybody were to close their eyes for a second and say, what is the good life? You wouldn't picture that, would you? 99% of people, when I say, what's the good life? You know what they picture? <laughs> it might be a glass of wine with a big meal and lots of pie. But it's not physically active, healthy living. It's because we live in a just in time society where we have to de stress. That's what we want. We are very much loving of our consumerism. We love consuming things. You know what? Great adaptation. Instead of five years ago, there used to be one blue box in front of every house. Now there's five. I thought reduce, reuse, recycle. Not recycle more and consume more. Oh, dysfunctional a bit. We love our conveniences. We drive around for 20 minutes to get closer to Polo Park Mall. <laughs> five steps. We love our wealth. I'd argue to you that those aren't necessarily awful things, CCW, counterclockwise. We need to add healthy lifestyles back in. So we live in this just-in-time society seeking, seeking shortcuts. We never want to do the hard work, which I'm sorry, 1976, eat well, exercise regularly. There is no solution. That's it, guys. Eat well, exercise regularly. There is nothing around it. There is no shortcut. There is no supplement on earth that helps you. Zero. They will lie to you through their teeth. Zero supplements that help. Zero. Zero. There is no diet that's good for you. None. You must have regular physical activity and good nutrition to match that. We grow up, we are born that way, and we've got pretty big range of dysfunctionality. What's optimal? Who knows? Whoops. Here's a scary one. I work in the sports field heavily for doping with the World Anti-Doping Agency. This is something that is very brand new. Very brand new. Good grammar. However, gene therapy. You know what we do? We take viruses and we crack the virus open. And you know which viruses we like to use? The adenovirus, which is a flu virus, or maybe even the HIV virus, which gives you AIDS. We crack those viruses open and we throw some genetic material in there. We close it back up. We deactivate the virus so it's not a bad thing anymore. And we shoot it into your body, aerosol or injection. And then we can change your body genetically. This, there's 2,000 clinical trials on gene therapy running right now for muscular dystrophy, diabetes, a whole bunch of diseases. Do you know what athletes have done with it? This is real, guys. This is brand new. See these two mice? They are what's called litter mates, the same. The mouse on your left is a mouse that has been injected with a virus containing a molecule that changes something inside of you called myostatin. Myo means muscle, statin means stop, myostatin. If you mess up myostatin it's, and make it not work properly, muscles grow. Un not uncontrollably, but nearly. Take a look at the bottom picture here. That's the mouse that's skinned. Okay, the skin's taken off. Take a look at its calf compared to its litter mate. Do you see the difference in the muscle? No exercise needed. None. Our athletes right now, some cheating athletes, are beginning to use this product right now to change the amount of muscle mass in their body. Completely undetectable. Very expensive, but completely undetectable. Now you want to hear a scary thing? 50% of Olympic athletes, when surveyed, said, would you cheat to get a gold medal if that cheating meant that you might have a serious side effect five years after 
getting a gold medal? 50% said yes. Now, this is a new story right here because you know why? If one of those athletes hires a PhD like me to do that little chemistry for them and they take and make the virus open up, they put the genetic material inside, that's easy, but they fail to deactivate the virus or modify the virus such that now they give it to their athlete and they go out to the community, that athlete may suffer a consequence, but now that virus exists and goes to all of us. Cheating brings on a new meaning into the new era. Gets really scary. I'll finish up with this. I think I have about how many minutes? Just want to make sure. I don't have my watch on right here. How am I doing? Oh, okay, good. This sequence of slides here is something that I do very, very, uh, this is some of the research I do. If you take a look at the skeleton in the center there, what I want you to see here is on the left hand side are slices of the people's body using quantitative computed tomography. So that's on your left. On the right hand side are what's called DEXA scans, dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. So the DEXA scans are on the right. You can see a DEXA scan on the top which is a picture of the person's spine. You can see the DEXA scan of their hip bones and you can see a DEXA scan of their femur and their tibia. On the left hand side you can see slices of their tibia, their femur and a slice through their knee. We do this research to study how bones change with activity and I'm going to show you some results of that. These are fancy technologies. I do a lot of imaging in my work and MRI and things like that. I'll show you some of the results. Here's one of the results from a, a recent study we did. On the top are seven people who were sedentary for a year. They had a lap for a year. If you take a look, that slice is where the arrow is. It slices right through here through your ham bone. So it's the femur inside your quad. There's a, a bone that looks like that. I've only shown you the bones. And the seven people on top are the sedentary ones. There's seven people on the bottom that are the same age, same weight and the same sex as the people above them. If you look at the bones at the bottom and you do a gestalty sort of thing and sit back and say, hey, what's the difference between the bottom bones and the top bones, I think it's obvious. These people on top have thin walls, right? The bones are thinner. They have a different shape. They're rounder. Do you see that? And the inside is eaten out. The bones on the bottom are healthy bones. The bones on the top, after one year, you can lose up to, in this section, in one year of inactivity, 20% of your bone mass there and it gets worse. In one year of being very sedentary, you can become, have bones like that. This is a, a little bit more difficult to see but this is the quantification. I don't want to show you too much graph. If you take a look on the vertical axis here, it says cortical area. That's how much high density bone there is. Do you see that? High density bone, less, lots. And then you've got the right leg and the left leg. The blue dots, if you look at the blue ones, that's actually the amount of high density bone in people who are active. The bottom one in magenta, do you see that graph, the lines there? That is people who've had spinal cord injury for a year. They have laps all the time. People who have spinal, I work with spinal cord injured folks all the time. They become inactive because of no choice. They got a slice in their spinal cord, can't move again. Those people, if you look at the difference between the two the graphs, the bone actually drops by about 20 or 30 percent in the thigh, but at the knee, it goes away completely. Completely. Here's a picture of that. Here's a slice in the top, see it says C up there, it says control. That's, if I, everybody take a look at me for a second. This is a bone called the tibia. It's right down here. It looks like that. The femur sits on top of that just like this. Everybody got that? This picture on the top where it says C on your right hand side is a picture of this part right here that sits on top of your tibia. You can see that it has high density bone in the normal subjects. The people are active. Take a look at the spinal cord injured person. Almost a complete absence of high density bone. Brittle bone. Now, I worked with NASA for a number of years, for about six years. 
uh, not the Canadian Space Agency, but NASA, because you know what? Spinal cord injury patients are good models of astronauts. And astronauts are good models of spinal cord injury patients. Do you follow me on that? So what we learn about spinal cord injury helps us in space flight. I design exercise equipment that's used on the shuttle and International Space Station. That's what I do for fun. Now, this is because I do this sort of research. Because I can figure out what can change their bones. How do you adapt their bones? Here is a scary one. This is what's called a micro CT. And on the right hand side is a piece of bone cut out uh, of one leg that the person could actually do this at. Watch, watch see, see what I'm doing? I'll, I'll go over here. So, sorry, he's panning me good. Okay, watch what I'm doing. One leg had the leg where they removed the cruciate ligament, which is a ligament inside your knee. That's what they did. And it says up there ACLX, that means get rid of the ACL. And then that leg became inactive. So the, that's what happens. You see that? So this one leg here is a good leg, right? Working hard. This leg is the bad leg. If you look at the difference between those, 12 weeks after they cut that ligament, take a look at the bone on the left. It's much more rarefied. It means it's losing bone. Do you see that? After 12 weeks, bone goes, goes away really quickly. Here's a 37, this is the spine right now. On the left hand side is the regular spine of a person at 37 years old. And for a person who is inactive by 75, take a look at the difference in the bone. I'm going to tell you this. I've studied five people since 1988, since 1988 till now. It's very hard to do to study people that long. And we did bone scans like this on those five people. All five of the people were super active. Now interestingly enough, what people will tell you is that your bone grows until 30 and after that it goes away. What we found out over this 25 to 30 year period is that these people had good bone when we measured them back in 1988 and now those same five people who are active have the same bone as what they had when they're 30. Meaning to say that if you stay physically active, you can keep your bones. I have so many people, I was just in Saskatoon doing a talk to 500 gray-haired females. What conference was I at? A postmenopausal conference. So it was me speaking to 500 women, talking about bones. Every single one of them was taking Caltrate. All of them had the little bottle, popped the Caltrate pill, which contains calcium, like from milk, and vitamin D, which helps your bones. But dysfunctionally, their amount of activity was very low. You can take calcium or Caltrate, and you will not have healthy bones. They all thought they were getting healthy bones from that. I'm going to be very clear to you so that this generation loses this dysfunction. If you take Caltrate and you are not active, you will have better bones than a person who does not take Caltrate. Did you got that? But if you want healthy bones, you must take Caltrate and be physically active. The only way to preserve your bones, meaning that if you start taking Caltrate and you don't have activity, your bones go like this, Whee! bye bye. Not as fast as somebody who doesn't, but if you take Caltrate and exercise and you're 30 or more, you can keep your bones for a really long time. But yet, we want the shortcut. This is easy. That's easy. Getting out and being active, not so easy. I'm not going to show you that one. Here's a slide on that. The person on the left is an inactive person taking Caltrate. That's a scanner of their tibia and their femur. The person on the right is an active person taking no Caltrate. White is dense. The denser the bone, the whiter it is. See the little thing on the bottom? See it says seven things on the bottom there? If you're going to take anything in your life, anything, whether it's tuna, a supplement, a vitamin C tablet, alcohol, whatever you're going to take, see that seven things on the bottom? We use this to make decisions 
I'll just quickly share this with you. Let's do vitamin C. Is, it, is vitamin C fair play? What do you think? Is it fair play? Yeah, it seems like fair play to me. So it gets check. Check. Is vitamin C against the law? No. No, so it's legal. Check, because I can buy it at Walmart. <laughs> is vitamin C performance enhancing? Mm, why do, if I go to grade six classes, I say, why do you take vitamin C? They're all saying to me, because I don't want to get sick. Well, if you don't get sick, you get more days to be active. So kind of indirectly performance enhancing, but furrowed brow. Health benefits? You don't get scurvy. <laughs> Any medical side effects from taking vitamin C? If you take 10 vitamin C tablets a day, it'll be painful when you go pee, and you might get kidney stones. Not that many, really. Safety effects? Not unless you slip on the bottle. <laughs> Financially, pennies a day. Now, if you notice, I didn't say yes or no to vitamin C, but see how the decision-making model guided you? Let's put marijuana through the test. In Canada, the last 25 athletes that tested positive for banned substances in sport, the last 25, 20 tested for marijuana. 20 of 25. Two for cocaine, one for steroids. And you're all going, it's a steroid world. No, no, no. Listen to this. Let's go through marijuana here. Fair play. Marijuana is against the rules of sport because of a Canadian snowboarder, Ross Rabagliati. Back in 1988, the Nagano Olympics, he smoked some pot, went to the Olympics, he uh, had a urine test that showed that he was positive in it, he nearly lost his medal. He kept it only because of a technicality. That technicality was removed, and from his day forward, all sports, marijuana is banned in because of him because they embarrassed a bunch of people like me, okay? So it's not fair play. Whether you like that or not, doesn't really matter. It's against the rules of sport. Is marijuana legal? Can't buy it at Walmart. <laughs> Is marijuana performance enhancing? Absolutely not. If I get on my motorcycle, 158 horsepower, and I smoke two joints, are you getting on the back of the bike with me? The smart ass in the audience, please say no. <laughs> but nobody will. It's not performance enhancing. And health benefits? Well, yeah, if you have glaucoma, AIDS, multiple cirrhosis, marijuana is used for those situations. But athletes don't have that. Medical side effects? Gee, I, I don't remember. <laughs> it has serious memory defects. It's carcinogenic beyond belief. Safety issues? Absolutely. Driving while impaired? Not good. Do you know what? Your generation, way better than mine. You guys, your Facebook generation, way better than mine. In my, in my, when I was 1976, graduating from high school, about 10% of us thought it was wrong to drink and drive. Right now, Addictions Foundation surveys tell us that your age group, 97% or more of you believe it's wrong to drink and drive. Good, way to go. However, only 75% believe it's wrong to smoke pot and drive. So parents in the audience, you ask your child, you look them in the face, and you look for what's called uh, averted gaze, okay? You look at their eyes, if their eyes shoot down leftward or right, they're guilty, okay? So, <laughs> watch it. Digver, I'm gonna look at you. Son, son, are you going out tonight? He goes, yep. You got a designated driver? Keeps looking right in the eyes and say, yeah, he's got a designated driver, good. No drinking, right, for that designated driver? Yeah, the next question's the important one. He's not gonna be smoking pot, right? Ah, his eyes did not avert. Good. The whole point about this, <laughs> safety issues with pot? Absolutely. Financially, 15 to $20 a bag in Manitoba. If you look at that, if you're an athlete, eh, not fair play, eh, not legal, not performance enhancing, no health benefits to the athlete, medical side effects galore, safety issues galore, financially not that bad. <laughs> For beer. So, Getting all your ducks in a row is a critical thing in your guys' lives. That's partly why you're here today, getting all your ducks in a row. When I was young, the benefit is I only had one of these rubber duckies. I had to buy this many to get this picture. <laughs> and I had to give them away to happy people. Rubber duckies, you're my friend. <laughs> it's interesting, when you want to change your life, 
We always do things like this. Want to, should do, must do. You know what? I love that little phrase. Want to, should do, must do. You know, the dentists, the healthcare professionals, they are the best at preventative medicine. They have perpetrated on all of us. When you wake up in the morning, you get your toothbrush and your toothpaste, that's a must do, right? Must do. Everybody does that. This should do. But exercise almost is invariably a want to. It barely even makes it to should do, which is interesting. How do you make Physical activity, a must do in your life. Schedule it, make it realistic. Here's one, and probably the biggest problem of our Facebook generation is this one right here. We must avoid dysfunctional behavior. We want, in our just-in-time society, shortcuts and rapid solutions to things. And with lifestyle, there is no rapid solution, zero. You either get it now, or you're in trouble. I'll tell you a, a study that we're just completing right now. Very scary. In the United States of America, they have a program in most universities that they have what's called the Freshman 15 program. You get to university in America, it's called the Freshman 15. The 15 refers to most people in first year university gain 15 to 20 pounds of fat in their first year university. So they've created the Freshman 15 program to stop that. What we found out in Manitoba, it's between grade 12, when you come out of grade 12, and university. It's not university that creates the problem. It's you graduate from high school, you've got that one summer to live life. <laughs> and you know what you do? We, we, we measured both girls and guys, and we looked at their episodic excessive drinking behavior, and more importantly, their episodic excessive over-calorie behavior that's associated with drinking, the McDonald's drive through And do you know what we found out? That on average, and this is an average, and this is just, we just finished this. On average, your age group between graduating from grade 12, I gotta go to university, I gotta live my life now, inappropriately, between then and there, you'll learn how to drink a lot of alcohol and consume a lot of calories. We found that the average was, and listen to this one, four, thousand calories a week input over output for all of the weeks of summer. One pound of fat, by the way, is 3,500 calories. Uh-oh. So interesting enough, one of the things we're working with the government right now is doing an intervention program for grade 11 and grade 12 and helping you realize not to get rid of that behavior, but to curb it, excess, reduce it dramatically. Scary proposition, but dysfunctional behavior is rampant. So putting all the pieces together, it's really critical for your future that you deserve happiness, and part of that happiness means being smart about it and getting the amount of exercise that you need. And you know what, when you start your exercise program, don't do the silly thing, this is bad, don't do this. January 2nd, you wake up after a hangover, and you go, I'm going to exercise. And you know what they do? I'm going to go five times a week to the gym. And if you go four times, you're a failure. What we do with people is you go, hey, you want to start exercise? Can you walk five times a week? They go, yeah. And I tell you what, if you walk once this week, because you didn't last week, that's success. If you walk five times, that's great success. If you don't walk any, OK. Do you see that? Set realistic goals for yourself. You deserve happiness. Balance your life, and a balanced life means that you're physically active. If you're stressed from cognitive load in university, exercise and physical activity is a wonderful thing. Make sure that when you're giving and taking, that you take the right amount of exercise in your life. Don't be fooled by anything about what you eat on this side. Yeah, reduce fat, but way more important is calories in over calories out is the rule. There is no way to break that rule. It's not when you eat, it's not what you eat, it's this relationship. So what I'd like to do is finish right now and saying, try to find that balance, try to put those puzzle pieces together, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Thank you.